I'm Will. And I'm Steven. And, and this, this is the Post Peak Chronicles. Chronicles. So Steven, what we have going on today? Ooh, we got an amazing guest. Today we're going to see things from the other side. Previous CO Corrections Officer, Hector Bravo. What's up, Hector? What's, What's on, going on, Hector? Out. Chilling. Thank you for coming through, man. Thank you. Thank you. Me. So, Hector, tell us your story. Where do I start, man? From the beginning? Let's talk about uh, where you from. Tell us about your childhood. Yeah. Originally, originally Brawley, California. Okay. So, southernmost part. It's um, like 120 miles east of San Diego. Desert, small city, small town. That's where they uh, grow all the stuff for hay, right? Agriculture, hay, hay bales, uh, yeah. watermelon, stuff like that. All kinds of salaries and, and vegetables. And... Um, Small town, man. You're, it, it, it's easy to stay trapped there. It's easy to stay stuck there so unless you do something to get out. Right. And in which case I did. I joined the military. Okay. Joined the army at 17. 17 years old. 17, man. Okay. Well, tell us about that. How was that? How was that experience? It was wild. It was the year it was 2002. Um, 2001 had just happened. Uh, it's 90, post 9-11. 9-11 had already mm. happened. I was actually already enlisted when those twin towers went down i was in delayed entry program mm. meaning i had already signed a contract was just going to wait till i graduated to ship right. out so I, I knew what time it was when i knew what time it was when when the twin towers fell mm. and um basic training fort banning georgia july 2002 you know the talks going on the talk you got george bush talking about uh, they had already invaded afghanistan right so they're talking about Iraq now. Saddam Hussein, he has weapons of mass destruction. He's like suppressing the people. America has to go and liberate these people. And we got to, you know, show force and do our thing. And um, so at 17, had my 18th birthday in there. So you're young. Mm. I'm young. I don't know. Mm. Uh, I'm young, man. I'm, I'm naive. So let me ask you a question. Cause I will be scared. I'm not. I'm not even gonna lie to you. I'm. You know, it's wartime. I'm right. um, 17 years old, turning 18. So how did you feel? Like, was you ready? Like, you knew, like, this is what I want to do, or was it a little bit of apprehension, a little bit of fear? All right, I thought I was ready. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Right. So I had seen the movie Black Hawk Down. Oh, I had no. seen the movie. <laughs> we were soldiers. And seen the movie Private Ryan. I yeah. think we were soldiers. Drop like that year, 01 or 02 mm. ish. And one thing I never put two and two together was, hey, there's going to be people shooting back at me. You thought you were just correct. going around shooting everybody. Yeah. You're like, hold up, there's bullets coming yeah, my way. Oh, correct. my goodness. I, didn't, I know that might sound like no. ridiculous, <laughs> but I didn't realize right. the grand scheme of things. Right. But they train you. Right. They train you. And I remember a little resistance in my mind. You know, they train you. And to keep it real with you guys, yeah, they train you. You're going to be a killer. Mm -hmm. you know, I was a grunt. I was infantry. Right. So they're, they're, this is O2. There's no poli There's no political correctness. There's no, you know, kumbaya, let's all hold hands. It's, you're going to be a killer. They attacked us. You're going to go get it. Mm -hmm. That was a um, switch for me. Like, man, this is, is this who really who I am? Is this really who I want to be? Is this me? And in order, maybe you could relate to this. In order for me to survive in that environment, I you had, had to, to adapt. I had to trick my mind into right. thinking this is Change me. your mind. I had else. to change my mind. And so then, you're in Iraq at 18 years old. 19 at that point. 19 year old in Iraq mm -hmm. fighting the Iraq war. Yeah. I'm sure you went through all sorts of dangerous scenarios. How long were you uh, out there deployed? 13 months. 13 months. In mm. uh, Balad, Balad, Iraq. So my contract actually worked out. Ideally, I trained for two years and deployed for one year and then I got out. Now, when you come back, how do you, you're a different person when you come back, PTSD, war stories, everything. How do you cope with that coming back into the United States? And what are you, 21 at this point? I had just turned 21. Yeah. I had just turned 21. It's a lot to see for a 21-year-old. A lot. And that was the year 2005. So you PTSD, 100%. But the scary thing is I didn't know that that was PTSD. Right. I thought I was losing my damn mind. I mm -hmm. thought I had lost my mind. The feeling of anxiety, I know what anxiety is now and I know the feeling, but to not know what's, what's happening to right. you, it was scary, man, crippling, yeah. um, crippling, just extremely scary, nauseating. So, so are you just a mess when you come back? Like, how do you, obviously, you know now, but what was, you Self, said you're losing your mind. Self-medicating. 
self-medicating. And that's okay. another thing. People don't know about self-medication. I didn't know about what I was, what, everything I was doing was as a result of happening, of being exposed to traumatic situations. Right. Self-medication. Ain't, nobody told me what you're doing right now is self-medicating. But understand that I saved up $20,000 in my bank account when I was deployed in Iraq. There was nowhere to spend it. There was no Walmart. There was no Starbucks. There, I mean, Amazon had just came on scene. So guess what I spent that $20,000 on in a year? Alcohol. Drugs and alcohol. Mm. A year. I was drunk a whole entire year. I was high a whole entire year. Mm. So how did you overcome that? Oh, man. So it was a lot of that. A lot of uh, messing up, right? And um, I ended up in jail. I ended up in jail as a result of my shenanigans. And while I was in jail, there was a payphone right there. And I called my dad and my dad said, hey, Hector, you got your letter from the Department of Corrections. He's like, I don't even think you can get in right now with what mess you're in. Mm. And I was like, damn. I got out. And that following day, I went to go take the written exam in Rancho Cucamonga. <laughs> and I passed. That's right. But <clears throat> my background investigator, just a couple months afterwards, right. like I had to put that down. Right. You can't lie, right? He's like, wait a minute, man. You were in jail a couple months ago? I was like, hey, I could explain everything, sir. Like, I came back, was hanging with the wrong people, doing some dumb stuff. Like, that ain't like that ain't me. He's like, you know what? I'm going to give you a chance. And he gave me a chance. And you didn't look back. No. So that, that stopped the majority of the craziness, right? Because now I'm a law enforcement officer. Right. Now I'm conducting myself in a certain manner. But it wasn't until three years in, in my career when I hit my bottom. You know, mm. alcohol, alcoholism right. had, had shown itself. So you're, you're still self-medicating at this point. Through alcohol, it just looked different. So it just... looked like, damn, this dude's balling. This dude has a girl. She's still my wife, you know, right. but this guy has a girl. He's living in San Diego. He has the apartment. He's doing it. He likes to party. He has money to party. In reality, that's still self-medicating. Right. So I kinda, had not addressed my PTSD or my alcoholism at that point. So you kind of went from an alcoholic to a functional alcoholic that now has a job and has to work and responsibilities, right? I wouldn't even call it functional alcoholic because I was still getting in trouble. I was just getting lucky. Keeping up appearances. People were like looking out for me. People, but it got to a point where, where it hit the bottom. And your whole department, because you're starting a CO at this point, does your whole department know you're struggling with alcohol? Be playing the part. A lot of people drink in the department, so it's like, hey, just maybe this dude just a little crazier than the other one. Maybe this dude just takes a little bit, ups the antics a little bit more. But it's kind of, it's kind of hard to identify if you're really going to hide it from people. Or you're right. going to hide it yeah. from people. Exactly. Okay. So, <clears throat> you in the department now? You say you reach your bottom. What was your bottom? I totaled my truck, man. Totaled mm. my truck and. Uh, Cops were looking for me. Everybody was looking for me. Um, my sister picked me up and she's like, hey, Hector, that's a, that, enough is enough. She saw she she saw she was one of the few that saw my, you know, isolation, crying alone in my room, drinking mm. to the end of a bottle of vodka every night, every day. She's like, enough is enough. You need to get help. And then for my sister to tell me that right. was like, OK, this is real. My dad was done with me. My dad was 110% done with me. He said, I'm dropping your ass off at the VA. You're no longer my son. Wow. You're no wow. longer going to call me. You're not my problem anymore. Wow. And drove my ass to San Diego. And thank God, thank God he didn't just drop me off and leave me. He waited with me right there. And it was the um, emergency room. I walked up. I walked up to the lady and I said, um, I need help. There's something wrong with me. Every time I drink, Bad things happen. I do crazy things. And she's like, all right, have a seat right there, and we're going to get to you. So how old are you at this point? Let me see. This was 2010, so I was 26. I've been sober since I'm 26, and I'm 38 now, so that's 12 okay. years of sobriety. Mm. So Congratulations. One, thank you. Yeah, and one thing I want to point out, like, sometimes you just got to ask for help, right? That, we think we're just men, and we can do it so, ourselves. You so, came to your wit's end and actually asked for help, and that was a life-changing decision. Let right? me address that on here. I was so stubborn, man. Prior to that, I would have rather died than to ask for help. Mm. That's how stubborn I was. Just being, you know, Mexican machismo, a male, a military veteran. You yeah. don't surrender. You don't show weakness. But let me tell you guys something right now. Asking for help was the most courageous thing I've ever done in my whole entire life. 
No, when you asked for help, did you just feel the weight of the world come off your shoulders? No. No? No. So how did that go? <laughs> it didn't. It didn't. I, I know the feeling of the weight of the world being lifted. Yeah. Like when I resigned, but we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. But no, man, I was, I was scared. I was scared. I was so scared, man. Like, I was ashamed, shameful. I felt shame. Now, I say asking for help is, is courageous. It is. But uh, it's not I, easy. I felt that yeah. shame. Like, yeah. This is this is what I've amounted to. This is the low bottom that I like. And but you know what they say, you gotta hit your bottom. There's only one, one way from there is up. up. Yeah. And everybody's bottom is different. The majority of people die. Mm -hmm. Die before they even mm -hmm. realize what happened. I've seen it over and over and over again. Man. It's a miracle. It's definitely a miracle. So you over you obviously overcame that twelve years sober again. Congratulations! Thank you. Um, so once you go through the program, you're still in the department, mm -hmm. and obviously you only way from <laughs> only way from the bottom is up. So now what is what is your life looking like? Yeah. So thank God my dad didn't you know cast me to the wolves like he said he did. Right. He actually put his neck on the line for me. He actually stepped up and talked to the warden of the institution and said my son has a drinking problem. He needs help. All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let them address it, and I addressed it. I have never, you know, put anything bad on their name. I kept sober. I kept my word. I right. kept. Uh, so after that, sky was the limit as far as the department. I promoted a sergeant, promoted to lieutenant, joined the crisis response team, which is similar to SWAT teams mm -hmm. on the streets, as an operator, hostage negotiator, then the commander. So it was just like thriving, right? Because that alcohol wasn't holding you back. Self I wasn't self-sabotaging myself right. anymore. Yeah. Had a daughter, mm. married my wife. Congrats. Thank you. And right. I'm assuming you had the support of everyone in your department because now with part of the shame is it's all out there now too, right? A lot of the stuff I kept under wraps, when they allowed me to go get that help, they allowed it under the guise of I was taking vacation. Mm. But people knew. I mean, you know, rumors fly and stuff like that. Yeah. But the thing about the department, man, it's like high school. Not everybody's looking out for your best interest. Not everybody's happy for you. Right. You know what I mean? I hate to use the word haters, but people can relate to the word haters. And right. that's that there's a, there's that's everywhere. Definitely. Absolutely. All facets of life. Not everyone wants your best interest. Nah. Does not want to see you. Especially yeah. when you hear it. Like, ah, oh, you're boring now. I like the old heck. You're better. Uh, here, here's a beer. I cut those dudes off. I cut those people off. Right. Not because I thought I was better than them, but because that's not me. That. I, that's not you that's anymore. Not that's me. not who you were. And if you hanging around these people and you're offering me something that you know it's not a part of me, then you're just going to drag me back to where I don't want to be. That's it. Definitely. You said bad company corrupts good character, there right? You go. Oof, first time I heard that. Yeah. That's a good one. He got a lot of them. He dropped jewels over <laughs> here. Tattooed on my arm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's Bible verse. But yeah. That's a good one. So you're in the department. You're thriving, promoting. Mm -hmm. You're, you know, sounds like you're the man there. Crisis response, lieutenant commander moving up um so what's going on at this point those are just titles those are just titles man uh it looks uh, on paper yeah i'm the man those are titles right but one thing i learned from the military was good leadership excellent leadership right and i wrote a book and i talk about this is where where i gained my leadership development guys that when i was 18 years old took me under their wing and ended up dying in iraq mm. so they showed me what true true leadership is to the maximum thing so I got more, it's always been about the troops for me. I got more satisfaction caring for my officers and at one point sergeants when I promoted lieutenant than, than the actual titles. I never called myself a lieutenant. I never, so yeah, then it got grimy at the top. So with these, Politics pro with these promotions, problem. guess what you get to see? <laughs> you get to see the big picture. Right. You get to see the behind the scenes. So tell us about it. What was the the breaking point for you? Because obviously it's not a big secret. You're no longer part of the department. Correct. So in you know, there's we've had conversations. Exactly. There's reason for that. So we had a conversation where you said it was um toxic and everything like that. So tell us about that. So that prison, Donovan prison, is is hard to work at. It's very hard as a result of all the missions that are there. You got mental mentally ill inmates, you got physically disabled inmates you got the whole everything you can think of every genre is in there which right. is it's not just one mission one goal it's do a thousand things and here here's your little 
Here's your keys. Figure it out. And if you mess up, you're going to get written up mm. and or fired. So in 2019, 2020, we got a new warden. And it was all bad and downhill from there. Mm. This dude ran it like Hitler, like straight dictatorship. Like if you weren't on, I don't know what type of agenda, narcissistic, narcissism, uh, mission this dude was on. But he created the worst environment I ever see. And to put the cherry on top, he asked me to be his right-hand man. Mm. So it's one of those things. I mean, in prison, if somebody hands you a knife and says, go stab that guy. You better get him. And if you don't, or else. If you don't do it, you're going to get stabbed. We're going to use that to get Damn, you. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't like when he, <clears throat> when he asked me to, that's what it felt like. And it wasn't a question. It was, this is what you're going to do. You know how it is. Like, yeah. That's how it came to be. So, so five months of that, this dude was something else, man. And he had his, the person underneath them, which for somebody they just promoted her, but I don't understand this. And then it was just a lot of unethical, immoral retaliation, hostile work environment, harassment, targeting the good people, the good people right. and enabling the, all the, the bad, bad people that actually got two cops, two officers almost murdered on a yard mm. as a result of that incompetence. Right. So I'm seeing this, man. Not only am I seeing it, I'm seeing it from the right hand man's seat. From mm. the from the So I hung on for so long because people were filing complaints. People were calling the whistleblower hotline. I hung on because I thought that they were gonna be held accountable. Right. Right? And it, that isn't that what they teach us? Right. Mm-hmm. They didn't get held accountable. So let me ask you a question. Because you're the right hand man to this Hitler like dictator, how are your sergeants and your officers, how do they perceive you? Because like you already know, man. Yeah. You already know. Man. So that also was tearing me apart right. inside. So aside from being the right hand man, he also made me his CRT commander, his crisis response team commander, which didn't look favorable in anybody's eyes. Right. It looks like I'm over here just sabotaging everybody and just so you're you know, in, sabotaging and enabling all this bad behavior going on in the prison. But is what it looks like. What it looks like, but those that know and those that saw me fight right. the fight, but what it worth it like it wasn't it was a drop in the bucket. Right. Compared to the image, the 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 perspective because for years you've been fighting the good fight for years you've been been promoted prior to him being there and everyone had respect for you and now you're the right hand man it was like earning like, bro respect. what are you they would tell me yeah like what are you me. doing they would tell me i'd hear him talk behind my back yeah they would uh it got so bad i, I mentioned the two officers almost getting stabbed right that was massive that was huge like i said troops were my priority so when that happens now you caused this you caused this like it could have been prevented it could have been stopped but you enabled this and now you, your blood is in your hands in essence yeah. and um my wife's sister ended up dying of covid in 2020 i'm sorry to hear that thank you mm, sorry about that and that same week my aunt had passed away mm. right and i'm still the dude's right hand man hey. my wife got that phone call man and it was <sighs> like like trauma like just you know because my my wife looked up to her as a motherly figure mm. so i text that warden and i said hey sir i'm not going to be in my wife just received uh um, news of her sister passing and his response was bring verification for both that was the final straw like i don't need this i don't want this i'm out so obviously everyone is the way they are for a reason why do you think this guy was such whether it's a power trip or Hitler, narcissist, why do you think he wanted... Because it seems like it's blatantly obvious to everybody else he's a terrible leader doing a bad job. Why do you think he was like this? I, I don't know personally, but from what like older OGs, COs have told me, and what I kind of make sense was like, hey, this dude was probably a lame from the start as an officer, like a lame officer, like a lame sergeant and all his peers just, you know, talking shit to him, like, and just got to the top by stepping on people where it was just turned up all the way up. Straight power trip. And now he's got and a, now I'm in control. And now he's got a chip on his shoulder. Something. So let me tell you something. So I tell him, uh, 
hey, it's, I'm done, sir. I'm out. Because he would always threaten me. <laughs> if you don't like it, you can leave. If you don't like it, you can leave. Bro, I had eight to four Saturday Sundays off. That doesn't mean anything to me. My integrity, my values, my honor, my morals mean more to me. You can't put a price on that. So I was like, I'm out. And he's like, oh, fine. I'll let you keep that commander spot. I'm like, oh, thanks, dude. <laughs> so when I left, this guy put up a, like a bulletproof wall in front of his office, in front of his door. Like that's how paranoia, like Hitler. Hitler was paranoid. Like these guys yeah. are paranoid. Who does that? Like imagine a boss or your boss putting up a, a barrier in front of his office. <laughs> it was wild, man. That's crazy. But even that wasn't enough for me to resign because I thought they were going to get held accountable. Right. And there was no accountability. Not even that. When we tried speaking up on that, we got retaliated against. Mm. Because it would get, even though it was a anonymous hotline. There is no anonymous. anonymous. There is no anonymity in anywhere. So the more you talk, the more you got retaliated against. They know. There's which, no confidentiality. Which is illegal in and of itself. Which is illegal in itself. Quid pro quo, whatever. You can't do that. But, which is illegal yeah. in itself, but there was so much worse that that even, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, retaliation is illegal in the state of California. <laughs> Even yeah. that. <laughs> That's crazy. Man, I mean, so the, the straw that broke the camel's back was your wife, my wife, and her mother, mm -hmm. and aunt, and you're done. What are you thinking at this point? Bro, I was like losing my hair. I went out shooting with like my family and somebody took a picture. I'm like, is that a bald spot? <laughs> They're like, yeah. Like, you know, just from the stress, stress, stress. like acne, uh, losing hair. And I'm just very unhealthy, man. Very, the stress, toxic toxicity. Quitting was never, resigning was never an option. It was like, I kept fighting the good fight, man. I would back these managers into a corner because I'm very good at what I do, man. Right. I'm very, and I know policy, which is even an advantage to me. Mm -hmm. I would back them into a corner, like five steps ahead of them. And then when they would see what I would done, they would just get the chessboard and just slam it on my head. Boom, not play by the rules. And then I would get burnt at the end. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't have to take this. You so, know what I mean? Yeah, most definitely. So you made the decision. Yep. Uh, what'd you say? December 1st? December 1st. December 1st, 2022. Yeah. I'm done. Mm -hmm. It's over with. So just recently. Just recently. One month ago. One month ago. It was liberating, obviously, but I'm sure there was some fear because you have a family. You have a four-year-old daughter. You have a wife. So it's like, what's next? What, there, did that there, enter into your head? There was no fear because I had planned. I okay. had put my ducks in a row. That's right. Um, it was a risk. It was a risk. It still is a risk. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. But I put my ducks in a row. There were certain little events that happened prior. Like I spoke to my wife's father, my father-in-law. I kind of told him, hey, um, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about quitting. I'm about to quit. Broke it down to him. He said, hey, I wish you the best of luck in whatever you do. To me, he just gave me his blessings. Mm -hmm. That's his daughter. That's his granddaughter. Right. That's kind of all, all I need. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they have faith in me. They have trust. And um, yeah, dude, I like had planted the seed in my wife's head like i'm gonna bounce soon get the finances like this this and that move right. stuff around and um i went to work not even thinking i was going to resign that day but my podcast had already aired on another friend's show uh mm -hmm. hot mic and my website had got discovered because i built my company mm -hmm. torment tactical and like i said those haters those haters i told you right because nobody it's like you're trapped there. Ain't nobody want to see you. Nobody bounce from that location. So they just started talking shit that morning. Why are you doing this? Why now? Why now are you speaking up? And I'm like, man, I've been fighting this fight. You know, I've been fighting this fight. So you know what? I'm out. So right. you are openly speaking up against the corruption openly. on podcasts while still working for them. I'm wild, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I made sure to keep my friends in check. Like I didn't want to put them... You know what I mean? I'm going to look throwing out for people under the bus. Right. Yeah. And yeah. It, was something, they were like, it looked like they were trying to get ahead of themselves. I'm like, Shh, bring it back in, bro. I'm leaving. You're not. Yeah. Uh, I got to look out for people, other people's interests. Yeah. Um, how did the uh, 
because obviously your podcast started before you even left. How did the the public respond to the content you were putting out? I didn't go. It wasn't on any level that I'm at right now, man. I have opened the floodgates. I have opened the floodgates of the truth. And um, yeah, I still withhold names. I'm not the type of individual to blast people. Right. But it's more so the experience. If people can put two and two together, people That's that on were it. there, they know. They right. know who. So your mission is to expose the truth. Let me ask you this. What is the truth that you want exposed? Wow. Just got real. I mean, is this, <laughs> is this free game or what? Yeah, fair game. Whatever fair game. Want, whatever you feel comfortable telling us. My truth is that the California Department of Corrections at the top, at the top levels of headquarters of Sacramento was so corrupt and not even like turning a blind eye. Not, not, or yeah, turning a blind eye. Not, they know what's going on because they would say, oh, you're from that prison? Oh, you poor thing. Mm. They knew what was going on, but it's one of those things. So, and we were having a conversation earlier. There's an image that, that, that officers and inmates are against each other and that the officers are beating up inmates like on a daily basis. That's not the case. We were communicating with each other. The way the media, media portrays, the way that the stuff like that, it's like the drama sells, negativity Definitely. sells. Definitely. So my message is like, hey, not every officer is bad. Not every sergeant, not every lieutenant. Um, are there bad apples? Yes, there's bad apples 100%. And as far as like the inmate population, man, in the growth that I've had as a man in the 16 years, I have seen men that switch. I've seen that switch where they are no longer that one person that they were. And I can relate to that switch because I had that switch. And so the only thing that separates us is the color of our clothes. Green versus Green blue. Green versus blue. Yeah. Green versus blue. But you came to a point like we are not different. We're not different. Let me tell I used to sit around work and, and talk to my peers like, man, the inmates are not even our enemies anymore. And it was the truth. It was the 100% truth. It was the administration. For whatever agenda, personal gain, whatever, it, it, it's, it's sickening. I, I can understand it. Right. So that's the truth. Do you feel the administration puts inmates against COs? You said two, two officers were almost murdered, right? What they do is, is it's so weird and twisted. It's so weird and twisted. It's not like cut and dry. It's very unethical. It's, they'll tell you something, and then you'll repeat it back to them, and they'll say, I didn't say, say that. <laughs> That's crazy. That's verbatim what you just said. Yeah. 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 And then you could even have like 10 people in the room be like, no, you did say that. I'm like, okay, cool. You guys are all lying. You guys are all fired. Mm. Wow. It's, it's kind of disgusting, huh? <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm talking about. It's not like black or white. It's like weird shit. Right. Shut up and listen. I call the shots. Boom. And my mom used to tell me that. Hector, shut up. They're your boss. They're your boss. Listen to your boss. And I said, Mom, this isn't the 80s or the 90s anymore. There's the internet. I can quit. (laughs) (laughs) I can quit. You know what I mean? And that's exactly what I did. Right. This ain't the 80s or the 90s anymore where you got to follow somebody BS. No, you can speak out now. Hold them accountable. Like you said, there's the internet. You can't hide when you have the internet. You know, it's just who's going to be the one to I, speak out. I guarantee they never thought I was going to do this on this level. And you want to know something? I haven't even done anything yet. No, it's just a drop in the bucket. I got everything in my back pocket. Right. It all depends on how far they want to take it. Right. Do you feel there's going to be a... Because, you know, so, even if we go today's world politics, right? We're like, oh, man, the corrupt at the top are never going to be held accountable. Do you feel with your voice and your platform you have now, do you feel justice will be served? Or are you just about exposing it and I, this is the information that needs to be told? I want, I want to put the heat on them. Um, I want them to feel it. Now, I don't, do I think the problem is going to get fixed? No. But I've been reaching out to the inmates' families. That, well, they've been reaching out to me. And they're like, hey, we've been going after your union, your union. I said, what? Don't come after the union. The union is a nobody. You need to go after these people. Sacramento. And she was like, wow, I never even knew that. I'd say, boom, it's just opening their eyes, you know? I said, tell everybody you know. Mm-hmm. And just real quick, I just want to say this episode is brought to you by the Jim Chula Vista. 
New Year's, get in your resolution, come and grab, get in shape. Now back to what we were talking about. So yeah, there's no goal other, and understand what I'm doing. I'm speaking out for the people that cannot speak out and they are hitting me up too. Hey, thank you. Thank you for being our voice. Are they feeding you information? They try, they tried or they try, but I'm not that, I'm not, that's not my goal. That's not my, that's not my goal to put out like either a prop. It's not propaganda, but that's not my goal to be smutting people up. Right. Right. I'm here to tell the truth. The the truth, truth period. Correct. This is the truth. Right. And, you know, I appreciate it from the other perspective. (laughs) Do you? (laughs) You know, I really do appreciate it because uh, I'm not one to say, oh, well, I did 16 years in prison. So do away with prisons. I mean, that's not, you know, but to hear from someone in your position to say, hey, it can be better. This is better. Like all inmates aren't this. You know, it changes the perception. You know, once you change the perception, then coming home, there's more afforded to you. You know, so that's why I appreciate this. It's not to say, oh, to hell with the department. That's that's not my job to say right. that I really want to just change the perception of what it means to be formally incarcerated. And while you're incarcerated, know like, hey, we're changing it out here. You can do better. Yep. Do better in there because when you come home, yep. look, they even the ones that are, you know, the seals looking at you right there, they're not looking at you how they used to. Right. We're not. We're not. You know, we're yeah. not. We're absolutely yeah. not, man. And then we have those discussions yeah. behind closed doors, which is weird, man, because you, you probably know how it was before. Uh, yeah. When I was when I was younger, I I wouldn't. And that's just how I came into prison. I was, I was 18 years old. I'm like, that's the see. I'm not talking to you. Correct. You know, like I, if I come talk to you, then there's a problem. And I started from Pelican Bay. So there was there wasn't that. Let's be buddy, buddy. No, you're over there. I'm over here. Right. As I went through my time and I saw it was different, like people would talk, we, you know, I'd chop it up, you know, things like that. Um, and it was just like, you're human, I'm human, and you don't look at me like I'm just right. an inmate or a criminal. Right. So I, I definitely appreciated that. And I've said that on a few occasions. I mean, I appreciate you treating me like I'm human. You, you know? are. And so but, yeah, uh, I definitely appreciate it. But being it. a lieutenant also gave me that, that, vantage point that viewpoint i was able to chop it up yeah right drinking my coffee just i had that extra time and they want to talk to a higher ranking individual mm-hmm. because hey you probably could get more uh more you know little privileges here or there i right. could try but i always kept it man to man right right there was always that line there's always gonna right. be that of course, hard line. Of course. you know what i'm of talking course. about yeah but conversations were man to man yeah that's good so you're out you got this pot let's talk about let's talk about your you to channel what is the guard uh that prison that guard. prison guard man i'm just astronomical growth what you say two weeks in two weeks up to six thousand and growing six thousand wow. two weeks subscribers and over a hundred thousand views mm-hmm. i it's mean two weeks it's humbling your mind has to be completely blown it's humbling yeah it's humbling man but but my personality is not the type and I've learned through experience not to get too excited right. and not to get too sad, right? I don't do those just, extremes. Right here. Just keep it we even. We just keep it even. Keep it even. Because you can go either way. You can go like, I've seen people just ride the roller coaster. And I'm like, get a hold of yourself, <laughs> man. <laughs> the highs and lows, like, chill, bro. Chill. <laughs> so, yeah, don't get me wrong. I see what's happening, but inside I'm like holding it together. You know what I mean? Right. Like. Bless, dude. Like, uh, I did that Fresno Bulldog integration video. And, you know, what the Kurt state is currently doing. What are they doing with that? Tell us about that video. Because I'm under the impression that, you know, the Bulldogs can only be in one spot. Yeah. Yeah. That it, one spot. Right. And so now what, is, what, is, what are they doing? They have decided. I guess they don't know what to do with them or maybe they want to show them a lesson or put it on them. But they have decided to just throw them out to the general population and other institutions. Southern mm-hmm. institutions, which is extremely dangerous, right? Because they're not wanted in the South. And any other violent or in the north or in or in the north or any other violent central valley the central valley where mm-hmm. they're right because and, and don't get me wrong for, i never worked with fresno bulldogs but right. from the word on the tier is that they created that atmosphere for themselves uh, yeah. they don't want to answer to nobody oh yeah not as a re- they, from what i've gathered they, some of them have talked to me recently not thinking that they're badasses but more so we're not going to be suppressed by another man right and i could kind of see that part but it's created this created this mm-hmm. monster yeah. So now these guys are hitting the main lines, very outnumbered, and they are not. 
I'm not going to say they're losing because there's some battles that they have won and or, you know, went toe to toe. Yeah. But other ones, they got the shit out of the bad. stick. Pretty yeah. Bad. And, it, you know, weapons are involved. Weapons, level four, level three. Yeah. yeah. That's unnecessary. That's unnecessary violence. In my podcast, I talk about necessary violence versus unnecessary violence. And that's what's the point of that? And this is all due to bad administrative policies. You know what I would love? I even myself considered as crazy, as wild as I am, going to Fresno and just talking to one of these dudes. Why wouldn't a manager of Sacramento go do that? I hey, you got be a, you got the you got the the guts to to mix them. Go talk to them. I got a question for you. <laughs> I got a question for you. Now you said in mixing those. What do you think about? The mixing the 50 50s. <laughs> what do you do? Bro, what I want to know I your perspective there. on I that. I was there on the front What lines. do you think about that? I had a 40 millimeter. The, the, oh, just for clarity 50 50 is you have a GP, you know, general population, and then you have the um, SNY. And what they do, SNY would be sensitive need uh, protective custody yards. So what they do is integrate those yards. Mm-hmm. Now, on the surface, you understand this is PC. This is GP. You do not mix those two populations. But in certain prisons, they are forcibly mixing these yards and that, saying, go out there we, and figure it out. And that can't end well. Oh, it's, 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 in some prisons, it's bloody mess. That's because the S and Y are outnumbered, right? That, no. No, no, no. It's the now, other way around. It's the other way around. Okay, it's the other right. way around. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's like putting cats and dogs, you know, the old school cats and dogs uh, yeah. um, analogy, but. Yeah, not only on the surface is that not a good idea. Underneath the surface Underneath. is not a good idea. All around is not a good idea. Mm. And that was the officers and myself saying that, but we didn't have a voice. Right. And every time we tried to fight and go against the grain, these captains wanted to make their bosses happy. So they would tell us to shut up or get us in trouble for, for trying to stop it or trying to... Uh... But Mule Creek Prison, I believe, was the first one to mm. integrate. I think Donovan was the second. I was part of the crisis response team at that time. We were staged in the visiting. I mean, they knew what was going to happen, so we prepared. Mm-hmm. And is it, you're setting them up in a way. Yeah. But people talk about gladiator fighters that were gladiator fights in Corcoran that were Back setting the them day. up. Right. But it's not the the guards or the officers that are betting money. No, we're like, fuck. This is a fucked up situation. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Sorry for cussing. I don't know the rules. No, no, you good. Bias, but, uh, <laughs> you good. Say what you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, man, I had a 40 millimeter launcher. The uh, and I was a lieutenant, so I the thought block my, guns. the block guns. It shoots a, a, a foam, kind of like the microphone looking yeah, thing, man. Rubber It'll bullets hurt you, break a bone. Yeah, I didn't got hit with one. Did you? It's not pretty. Oh well, man, <laughs> bruise you up real good. It's not pretty. Yeah. Yeah, we um, two dorms. We walk them. It kicked off. It kicked off. It blew up. It exploded, and just shooting them all up, shooting them up the leg. I mean, I shot one guy. One, two, three, four, four times up the thigh. Boom, mm. boom. And it was a single launcher. I'm pretty good at faster reloading. Boom, boom, boom. Zip tie them. Take them to the uh, the handball courts or the basketball courts. Right. They tell them, we're going to take off these flex cuffs. And we're going to walk you back to the building. <laughs> and we're going to keep doing this all night long until you guys stop. And just hearing that was like... Oh my God! What, what is are, the point of this? What are we doing here? What is the point? What are we doing here? Because mm. they're not going to back down. Well, they did, yeah, but I eventually. mean, eventually, it's not just going to be like, "Oh, sorry, let me stop right now." No, but it's going to be over, yeah, exactly. and over and over again until at some point the ones who are never going to give up they get shipped out, and the ones who are like, "Oh well, I'm just going to so do my time," they stay. It was weird. It was. Um, I don't want to say sad, but it's not a cool, that's not a cool situation. No. So like they're looking at us like, hey, you guys are doing this, right? That we're, we're looking back like, hey, man, please, like, please figure it out. Yeah. Like, figure it out. We even told one guy, figure this out. Talk to, talk to each other. And yeah, man, they stood right there talking to each other. Enemies, enemies in the prison system. And for that night, they slept in peace. You know what I mean? But it was after a whole night of fighting. And that was all an avoidable situation. <laughs> one hundred and ten. <laughs> that was that was just one incident. This was happening across the state of across California. Across the state, and because the worst over of and it over is, again. they'll put like say they bring a group a bus of SNYs to a general population prison. So now they're outnumbered. Well, they do the same thing on the uh, on the reverse. They'll bring a bus of GPs to an SNY yard, and so even if you 
have a mindset of I'm not tripping, you may be afraid because they are going to trip on you. So it's like, I'm going to get you before you get me. You yeah. take off. You take off. And so it's. So a yard that yeah. even that in situation in itself, I don't have to tell you created a dangerous atmosphere for the officers and the staff because on a yard, they kept fighting. They kept fighting. Mm-hmm. They kept slashing dudes, stabbing dudes. And we left them there. We left them there. We left. I told my cops, guess what they're about to do next? They're about to go off on us. Then I look like, damn, how does this guy know? What else are they going to do to get off of that yard? If you hit a cop, you're going to get off that yard. Gotta go. And, oh my God, dude. Yeah, it was a Sunday. They kept going off on us. Staff assault after staff assault after staff assault. Finally, you know, they higher ups got to be like, oh, hey, whoa, let's stop this. There's something going on. Man, that is wild, huh? It's it's wild, you know, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't understand it. You know, like we're talking about from two different perspectives, but we're saying the same thing. Same thing. Yeah. You know, the exact same thing. It makes no sense. And it's avoidable. It's if you just think it's avoidable. Through. And to be the voice for the people that are dealing with it now, cops are speaking out now about this Fresno yeah. Bulldog integration. Mm-hmm. Same thing. The same thing. Same thing. For years they've been in one prison. They've been in one prison in one area, on the yard by themselves. Yeah. And don't get it wrong, I, I, I don't love Fresno Bulldogs. I yeah, don't it's love not, it's not about that. It's not about. It's that. not about it's that. Like it's about right people, or wrong. What, well, right people, or wrong? What are we doing period. here? Yeah, people's safety, right? Yes, that's yeah. it. What are we doing here? And it's real volatile situation. <laughs> oh man, we can talk about that for days. <laughs> it's it's crazy, Steve. You man, it's crazy. <laughs> So, oh man. But so let's get back to the podcast, the streaming service. Mm-hmm. Man, again, incredible things going on. Where do you want to go with this? Um, just continue to tell that positive message, positivity, man. People I want to help people before they reach a bottom like I've ever reached mm-hmm. and or when they hit that bottom, hey, guess what? There's help. Right. There's help out there. Reach out. It's not less than, it's not I don't know if you watch the news. I don't, but it's I almost too. I don't. Me, neither I do don't I. Anymore. It seems like the world has turned negative or negative perception. I'm right. trying to bring that good back, right? In any little tiny way that I can. Yeah. Every little bit do. Every little Every, bit do. Right. Helps, Somebody sure. hears your message. You help one person, and that help. one person helps another person, and another person, and you know, yeah. it's trickle down effect. It's a snowball effect. Yeah, definitely. Man. So, so, let me ask you this. One thing I've heard, you know, they always say like there is. Because you've been in the military. So I've heard this a lot, like COs is like, like prison, they're in prison. But I also heard like the military is like prison. Yeah. Let me hear that perspective. Because I've heard that. And of course, we, you know, thank you for your service. Thank you. You know, I, I don't have anything but love for, for the military. But from someone who was in the military, I just want to understand that perspective. Well, it's the military. You sign a contract. You sign your life away, so right. you can't walk away. Your government property. Yeah, you go. One of my homies got government property <laughs> tattoo on his back. It's kind of funny, but uh, you can't walk away. You walk away, you're a wall. You're gonna lose it all. You're gonna go to prison, federal military <laughs> prison. So you're you're incarcerated, right? You're you're held down by something, and the structure structure. You're gonna wake up at this time. You're gonna form it up at this time. You're gonna work out at this time. You're gonna eat at this time. Uh, I was in the infantry back then. Back then, they didn't have females. So it's all this testosterone. Mm-hmm. You're surrounded by a bunch of heavy hitters. So you're just that brotherhood. You're just building, right? You're young. That's how it kind of compares to prison. Right. You're taking orders. And then many times, you're just a, you're a number, right? You're a number in the military, yeah. but on the personal level, those leaders were the best. I cannot even emphasize on... I don't think it's that way still. I'm sure you still do have great leaders. You have to. You have to. But they made you feel like you weren't just a number. Mm-hmm. And if you're a supervisor and you have subordinate, that's it. Get to know your cops. Talk to them. It's relationships. It's That's how it kind of compares, man. Definitely. Violence, violence. Right. Definitely. Because I've, I've heard that and I've been, you know, I've had the opportunities. A lot of people that are in the military that, you know, come to the gym. Yeah. And oh. I talk to him all the time, and I hear that, and then I'm hearing stories. I'm like, man, it's not. So, yeah, my buddy did 20 years in the Navy, you know, all the way up to, like, a higher-ranking officer. They're like, officer so-and-so, and he's like, 
he got out of the Navy, he's like, don't call me by right. my slave name. <laughs> slave name. <laughs> I got a real name now. So he's, you know, because he felt the same way. Like, yeah. That's my slave name. So don't call me that. Even the food was crap in the military. I oh, mean, I, I wasn't, that a lot. I wasn't complaining. I, I, I'm going to enjoy a meal when I'm starving to death. Right. But like when I would be in Ad Seg in Sentinella, mm-hmm. A5, South eating the inmates. You were you? Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and the inmates, you know, talking shit in, in a jokeful manner, right. like, oh man, this food is garbage. And I'm like, hey, you're eating better than the military. Man. They're like, what? <laughs> nah, no, we're not. I'm like, trust me, man. Cause I, I tried that food out, yeah. tested it before, you know what I mean? And um, oh yeah, there was times we ate some <laughs> some, some uh, terrible stuff. Those powdered eggs that turn oh, yeah. back into liquid when you let them set for a while. <laughs> <laughs> man. So How's your daughter? You talked about your daughter. Tell us about your daughter, it's man. My whole entire world, dude. Yeah, dude, I love my daughter to death, man. She's actually, you want to talk about the straw that broke the camel's back or what was the changing point that made me resign? My daughter, dude, looking at her, she, I saw something. I can't tell you what I saw, but something told me you're selling yourself short. You're not the full potential father. You're not the full potential husband that you're capable of doing. There's something wrong with you. And there was. I was withdrawn. I was isolating. But it di- this isolation looked different than my Iraq coming back isolation. So it was just like being quiet. Going to family get-togethers when I went and just being quiet, not talking to nobody. Kind of just keep my head down. And I thought I was doing good because I wasn't backhanding the wife or kicking the dog or slamming doors. Right. So I figured I'm doing good. I got this. But as soon as I resigned, man, my daughter has not, not stopped climbing all over me, <laughs> loving awesome. me. It is unbelievable. Your energy She back. can feel that energy, man. Yeah. It's funny, too. We don't know, like, sometimes a toxic work environment or toxic relationship can be so backbreaking. You think you're fine, but you're Correct. just quiet and withdrawn. And, you know, you may not be going through the PTSD and the trauma of coming back from Iraq, but right. you're just not yourself. And everyone around you sees it, but you're like, hey, I'm not hurting anyone, so I'm just doing my thing. You, but you can tell there's a difference as soon as you resigned. They, they sell you a good product. They sell you a pension. They sell you $100,000 a year. They sell you health insurance. So it's not in anybody's best interest to walk away from that, mm-hmm. right? Unless, unless it's mentally taking its toll on you to the point that it was for me. Mm-hmm. I couldn't hide it anymore. Right. I couldn't... My, I, my troops were about to see me kind of break it down. And I'm not about showing anybody I'm about to break it down. You know what right. I mean? So it was not going to be a beneficial to them. And I told them, check this out. I'm going to be able to help you better outside of this department than I can. I've already reached my ceiling here in this department. I've seen what they're about. And I've been doing it. But my daughter, man, she was crawling on me right now. But before <laughs> I came over here, it's like, it's, I can't, I can't put words to it. Right. I can't, put, I can't, man. It's everything I've ever wanted. How old is she? Four. Mm. It's everything I've ever wanted. Man. Well, definitely congratulations yeah. on that. So 2023, this is just the beginning right now. Where do you see the heights of not just your podcast, not just, just your life this year? Like, Where do you want to be? Grow, growth, growing, right? Grow for sure. But uh, this is going to be a lifetime thing for me. This isn't going to be a short term or anything. Right. It's, I'm just going to continue to do what I'm doing, spreading the positive message and just getting out there, getting my name, myself, my face out there, right? Touching more people. That's the goal. Um, probably what it'll look like is probably more podcast appearances, mm-hmm. right? Networking. I'm new to this whole world, this whole out nine, outside of the nine to five right. grind, but it's awesome. I, am, I, I love it. Yeah. Because you don't know what's gonna happen it's like an adventure well i don't know what you used to look like but man it looks good on you (laughs) it it definitely looks good on you i shed the fat dude (laughs) (laughs) yeah you just seem it's like a joy i seen your hands shaking at one point like it but it was like with excitement that's what somebody told me yeah man you could see it when you talk yeah In, in high school i was a class clown yeah i used to love making people laugh i used to talk to everybody yeah and uh the military and the prison constricted me into a, a, a you know. Like the fun Hector was gone. Gone. He's coming back now. Gone. Oh, he's out here, man. <laughs> Got my hand tattooed. I feel great, dude. Like, man. This is it. This is it. This is it. It's yeah. a beautiful life. This, I could do anything. Man. 
And you I can and you will do anything, you know. And I don't know about you, but I definitely appreciate you coming through, telling us your story, talking to us. It's, it's been a pleasure. And shedding light on what's going on from the perspective of the prison guard. Thank you. Thank yeah, and it's you. just the beginning. I mean, hopefully we have the same goal, too. We all want to see a reform. We all want to see things done better. And the whole, you know, humanizing the inmate, humanizing trauma that these people had in their past you know no one just wakes up today and decides to be an evil murder and drug addict right some sort of trauma happened in their lives and what you're doing you just want to see things done better you know? fair fair we want to see things done better and fair we want everyone to get a fair shot and just kind of change the way things are done if that leads to policy changes if that leads to structure changes then i think we're all doing the right things it's good you know we're all from different walks of life with different. the same goal same, same goal. goal. Yeah. Same goal, man. <laughs> Look awesome. at us. <laughs> yep. Here <Yeah>. we are. <laughs> this is amazing, man. Definitely. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, how can they reach out to you? Okay. I'm on uh, YouTube, That Prison Guard. And then on Instagram, Hector underscore underscore Bravo. So that's my that's my handle right there, Hector Bravo. Got it. I got a website, uh, torment-tactical.com, right? And then I offer uh, a program, fitness, training, and uh, mindset for those that want to get right. Okay. You know what I mean? You heard him, man. There you Hector go. Bravo, check him out. The Prison Guard, incredible man, incredible story. So, this is another episode. I'm Will and I'm Steven and this, this is, is the, the Post P Chronicles. Chronicles.